So we are up to the seventh lecture in the course. Actually, it's more than that because of the different threes. But um, we're in the second part of economic substantive due process. So um, we're kind of looking at the rise of the Lochner Doctrine. Um, so we have, uh, um, I believe, uh, uh, three major cases today. Lochner, of course. Um, it would it would probably wouldn't make much sense if uh, if we uh, um, didn't uh, cover Lochner when the basically it's called the rise of Lochner. Um, Mueller versus Oregon, which kind of is a it almost seems like a one off a little bit. And then Atkins versus Children's Hospital, which is where Lochner kind of gets uh, it gets really um, locked in. So this actually comes from Utica, Utica, the uh, uh, birthplace of uh, Chuck Schumer's father. Interestingly enough, he was an exterminator, um, but he was not involved in the Lochner case. So New York, being uh, at the time a little bit more progressive than other parts of the country, enacted the Bake Shop Act. Now, I think you have to think about this with, um, with bread and stuff a little bit differently. So, you know, I mean, most of us probably, if we're going to get some type of a bread, you know, we're probably just going to go to Wegmans or Tops or, or you know, you probably, one of the things is, is that, uh, you know, you don't see the amount of bakeries that you used to in this country. Now, if you were to go to France, of course, you know, you have all kinds of boulangeries, um, but not as much anymore. It's much more commercial um, where, um, you know, Things are done in more of a um, um, economies of scale, if you will. So you know, I mean, if you if you just think about it, you know, if you get a loaf of white bread at Wegmans, it, it you know, if I get one at the store I go to in Sheridan Drive, it probably wasn't baked there. Now they probably do bake some stuff there. I think I think they make their own donuts, um, but you know, you can you it, it becomes more economical. But um, back then. You know, you didn't have Wegmans. Well, you actually didn't have Wegmans. I was thinking that, you know, you had the original kind of small store in Rochester, but I don't think it came around at the time. Um, but, you know, you kind of had your more mom and pop type of uh, markets and things in cities and in small towns and things, you know, general stores and stuff like that. Um, so as far as bread, you know, if you lived out in the country, you probably might have baked some of your own bread, um, or even in some cities, too. Um, didn't have a whole lot of suburbs at the time. But um, you had a lot of bakeries that were producing bread for people. So some people would go to the bakery, but um, a lot of times what some of the bakeries would do is that, you know, they bake the bread and then they'd, uh, you know, distribute it out to places that were going to sell it. Now, um, one thing about baking bread is that... Um, there's a lot of stuff to it. I mean, it's not, uh, you know, it's not where you just, uh, it's not like taking a can of beans and putting them in a, in a pot and, you know, turning on the uh, um, heat on your stove. You know, you have to, you have to, you have flour. And, you know, one of the things about flour is that, you know, it spins or, you know, it, it, I'm sure if any of you have worked with flour or if, you, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, put a picture here of the last time I made biscuits, but, um, you know, it can get kind of messy. And one of the things is, because it's so fine, you know, one of the things that you could potentially maybe be doing is uh, breathe some of it in, which, um, you know, you probably don't want to breathe a lot of flour in, into your system. Another thing is, is that the way a lot of um, uh, bakeries would work is that um, people would want the bread uh, and it would go out earlier in the morning. So people would start really, really early, almost like kind of in the um, dead of night. Um, so the, the one thing I'm just saying is, is that, uh, you know, there, there are reasons why you would want some types of um, uh, regulation. So it prevented bakeries to work people more than 60 hours a week or 10 hours a day. Ah, so Lochner was convicted of this. So the Lochner Bakery. Um, I have uh, I have tried to Google this. I've uh, um, I haven't really found anybody um, 
going to teach a class in person that's from Utica. If you are, um, please email me because uh, um, I always kind of wondered if there was like a mock marker or something um, where the Lochner Bakery used to be. Because because I, I, from what I understand, it's not there anymore. And I've never been to Utica. I've been to Rome, but I've never been to Utica. Um, you know, I used to live in Binghamton, so I got my PhD. And um, I always thought that, uh, you know, that uh, Utica was kind of the, uh, um, kind of like Binghamton, except uh, much more in decline. Which the thing is, if you've ever been to Binghamton, you're kind of like, hey, it's, it's saying something. So two years later, he's convicted for a second time for the offense in 50 days or $50. He didn't pay it. So he loses at the New York Court of Appeals level. And uh, remember, our, the New York Court of Appeals is the highest, the court of last resort in the state of New York. It's not the New York Supreme Court. That's actually our trial courts. Um, so based on the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. So notice this word. So if you remember back, um, you know, go back to the slaughterhouse cases, you know, Justice Miller was kind of like, no, no. Then the door opens a little bit. Then an Algier, the, you know, it's not just a foot in the door with Algier. It's literally, you know, you've, uh, you've, you've put somebody completely through the door where there's a lot of people following behind them in the door. Now, is it going to be that you're going to have, um, you know, like a, you know, army of people coming through the door as a result of Lochner? And the answer is yes. But, the liberty of contract and private property under the 14th Amendment due process clause. So um, I don't think this, I think, I don't think this is actually the Lochner Bakery, but I, I have a picture of the old bakery. So for Lochner strike down the law, it says it doesn't, it doesn't apply to all bakers, it, it singles out certain bakers. So it's really not, they, he's saying it's not really a health measure and it's not a dangerous occupation. So what he's saying, uh, Mr. Lochner, and the one thing to remember is, is that there are, there are people behind these lawsuits. So, you know, always remember that whenever you see lawsuits that go up to the Supreme Court, that often there are, you know, people in groups behind them. You know, for instance, um, you know, in Roe v. Wade, there were groups behind getting Roe v. Wade up to the court. There were groups behind getting the Dobbs case up to the court. So, you know, if you remember, you know, the, the Spencer and Cooley folks, you know, really wanting to push this, economic, this uh, social Darwinism, laissez-faire um, type uh, of uh, philosophy. Uh, that's all well and good. And maybe it's good policy. I am not saying it's not. I'm not saying it is either. I'm, I'm neutral here. I'm basically trying to be like Switzerland, who is neutral. Um, sort of. Um, but one thing you always kind of have to wonder is that whenever you're asking the Supreme Court to step in, the Supreme Court's not elected. The New York legislature and the governor of New York are. So you're asking the court to come in and say that we're going to take this decision away from the New York legislature and the governor of New York, and we're going to put what we think, based on kind of maybe a questionable constitutional um, doctrine, to overrule you, to overrule the elected people. So they also tries to distinguish it from Holden versus Hardy. So remember, that's the case that uh, that we ended on last time, where the court said, you know, okay, you know, mining's kind of a d dangerous thing. So what? The court, what, what the Lochner was trying to say was, this is just a labor law. And, you know, you can't do that. You can't regulate labor. And I want you to kind of um, be looking at this and seeing the way this stuff is getting turned around um, to the way that uh, um, the social Darwinists want. But the one thing that they want to do is distinguish it from Holden versus Harvey. You know, which had, uh, which had only been decided, um, you know, when it had been decided, um, like, uh, when was it decided? Uh, um, a few years before. I think 1890, was it 1896 or 1898? Um, 
I think it was 1898. Um, so basically to try to uh, say, you know, okay, no, 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 no. Um, Holden versus Hardy, it's a special, it's a something special because of the unique things of mine. So here's a big one. Employers and employees have a right to agree on hours and wages without governmental interference. Um, means Meaning it's a violation of the 14th Amendment. So it's encroachment on the right to contract and private property. So I want you to just think about how broad that statement is and the potential um, of the implications of it. If that's the case, this basically would wipe out minimum wage, working conditions, probably wipe out OSHA. Um, this would wipe out pretty much um, any type of government interference with your relationship with your employer, unless maybe you work for the government. Um, I work for the government, so, you know, be a little bit different. So, you know, imagine that, you know, that uh, it was kind of, it would kind of open it to be the Wild West. Now, one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that, um, you know, kind of immediately um, at, after COVID, um, when stuff started opening up, remember how places were, you know, just very desperate to get employees? I mean, you still see a lot of help wanted signs, but it's starting to, I mean, you still see a lot. I mean, but maybe it's uh, the economy's maybe cooled a little bit since then. And there are a lot of other, there are a lot of things going on with worker shortages um, so that we can't get into. But, you know, the one thing I was just going to try to um, point out there is that um, that's one of the times where, um, where employees have a little bit more ability to um, kind of have things more in their favor. Because the problem is um, for workers, generally the employer has the upper hand. Because, um, you know, while an employer needs employees to make money, the employer just, just generally has more power because they're the one that gets to decide whether to hire you or fire you. Um, you know, another thing that kind of Lochner would basically do um, would basically mean no unions, which is kind of what a lot of the conservatives and, and, and social Darwinists wanted, that no unions. Um, but keep in mind this, is that whenever you don't have the government um, able to e have even some of the more basic regulations um, of the employer-employee relationship, it's going to have the effect of helping employers in more cases. Now, some of the arguments, of course, are that, you know, it'll make the economy better, blah, 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 but uh, um, without at least some reasonable regulation. So New York wants to uphold it. So they're saying, you know, the police power here is uh, elastic, and they make kind of a judicial deference argument. Often you will see this um, whenever the government wants a law upheld. And that is, leave this up to state legislators that know local conditions that may be unique to the area. So the state has an interest in health and safety for food. Bakers perform their jobs at night. They're often very repetitive. So, I mean, you just think about this. You know, we're entering the Industrial Revolution. But, uh, you know, a lot of this is not do being done in kind of more of an industrial scale. Um, they also said poor ventilation, other unsafe standards, you know, people breathing in flour. I mean, I don't know if I've breathed in much flour, but uh, um, I would kind of guess maybe it's not that great for your lungs. Um, you know, some people would say it's not very good for your, for the rest of you, um, too much flour. And some people have gluten allergies. Um, so the law reduces their exposure to this environment. So what we have here is a five to four decision. Five to four decision. So this is a pretty um, big decision. Now, of course, Lochner has been overruled, just to let you know. I'm, I may be giving you, I may be giving something away, um, but I always kind of wondered about this picture here because um, 
Um, the Supreme Court, for a long time, what they do is they, at the beginning of the term, they take what uh, sometimes we know is their class photo. Um, and uh, you, you have in this photo here, um, I think it is, um, um, if you notice, that uh, um, versus some of the ones that we saw kind of a little bit uh, uh, more um, post-Civil War, um, you don't have uh, you don't have as much many uh, uh, beards here, but the thing I always kind of wondered about this picture is that that uh, the person in the middle there is uh, Justice uh, Melville Fuller, who is the Chief Justice. So so in these photos, if you remember, I was telling you earlier, um, the Chief Justice is the one sitting in the center. Um, I, I always wondered why he had that little footstool that he has his foot on, um, you know. Um, I, I don't know. Now, another thing that I would just tell you is this. Who nominated Melville Fuller to the court? Grover Cleveland. So again, one of the things that I really want to kind of emphasize is that kind of the way we think of Democratic and Republican presidents and their parties and their views on the issues are not necessarily how they were back then. So here's the long and short of it. This law interferes with the right of the contract between an employer and employee. The right to contract is part of the liberty clause of the 14th Amendment. So, aka, economic substantive due process. So just be thinking about that a little bit whenever, um, whenever we get to um, the case on gay marriage where they use the due process clause. And, uh, you know, this is something that, uh, that we'll find in the Dobbs decision that Justice Thomas, Justice Thomas, a big critic of Lochner, is saying, you know, you based a lot of other stuff on substantive due process, uh, not just abortion. So, you know, he's saying, oh, get rid of Griswold, get rid of uh, Obergefell, uh, get rid of Lawrence. So, you know, the fact is, is that, you know, are some of the justices maybe conflating things a little bit? So there's a general right to contract and business in the liberty of the individual protected in the 14th Amendment. So remember, the 14th Amendment, you know, has some stuff for the Fifth Amendment, but, you know, it doesn't literally, you know, it says you know, life, liberty, and property. Um, but kind of how literally do you read that? How do you read it? So the right to purchase or sell labor is part of this liberty interest. Now, the court does say that some that the states do have a limited right to regulate under their police powers. Um, now, um, with uh, Justice uh, Peckham, Justice Peckham here uh, in uh, writing uh, majority opinion here, um, remember, I think Holden versus Hardy was a seven to two decision to uphold it. So Justice uh, Rufus, his first name was Rufus. Um, don't see a lot of people in the United States named Rufus anymore. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, my uh, grandmother's name was Ruth. Um, you don't see as many people named that anymore. Some some names gain more popularity. Some uh, some names uh, lose popularity. You know, um, Game of Thrones was on. Uh, you had a number of people that were named um, Khaleesi. And uh, Arya, you know, um, one thing is, is that um, when um, Twilight was on, I think the name Bella became very popular, um, including, I think, um, I think it became one of the most popular names for cats and dogs, I think. So, um, you know, there you go. Um, so they're trying to distinguish Hardy, saying it was limited to specific circumstances that are not present here. So, um, you know, if you didn't have any, any limits to the state's police powers, it would render the 14th Amendment meaningless. So basically what they're saying here is that, um, you know, the power to regulate, let's say, you know, for, for public health, it's not here. That this is basically a labor law masquerading as a health law. So therefore, basically things that are pure labor laws are not subject to the state's police powers. So 
Um, interesting quote here. Clean and wholesome bread does not depend on whether the baker worked 10 hours a day or 60 hours a week. Now, I think one of the things that they're looking at there is that, uh, you know, they're kind of saying, well, um, you know, the bread coming out um, versus, let's say, um, versus, let's say, uh, the effect actually on the, the baker, um, him or herself. That actually was a picture of, uh, of the Lochner Bakery. Um, it's, it's not there anymore, but, uh, um, I did find that picture for you. Um, so the, which power is going to prevail? Justice Peckham says the power of a state to regulate or the right of the individual to liberty or person in the freedom of contract. So one of the reasons that we read the contract clause is that, uh, you know, while it kind of take, took, it took a, um, a strong downturn after uh, Marshall, you kind of have that word contract, but more in terms of the 14th Amendment rather than Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution. So there is not a re enough reasonable relationship to public health. So the trade of Baker has never been found to be an unhealthy one. So there's where you kind of start getting the slippery slope arguments. So you will see slippery slope arguments made by members of the court. You will see mem these arguments that will always be made by people advocating. And that is, if you allow this, will 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 subsequent things happen? So you know, if 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 you can do, if the government can do this, what would they do next? So it would extend to all trades for regulation. So if you could limit how many hours somebody can work, it could be crippling for a family. So many things could be considered unhealthy. Now, it could lead to much more regulation, employer hours, professionals, artists. Um, it could also, th those could also pass on, on kind of how this is put together. So basically saying that this is a labor law this is a labor law it's not designed to to help uh, public health so they go from reasonable to the sacrosanct nature from reasonableness to basically a sacrosanct constitutional principle of the employer's um right to contract with employees and vice versa so basically i mean if you just think about it if uh if you have a job you kind of have entered a contract that, you know, let's say if you let's say if you work at Wegmans, um, you know, you're going to you're going to agree to, uh, you know, let's say um, work X number of hours a week um, for X number of dollars and with X number of benefits. Um, but, um, you know, there are things that Wegmans has to do. Um, that are regulated. You know, they have to pay a certain amount per hour if you're an hourly employee. You know, if you work over a certain amount of hours and you're an hourly employee, you get paid overtime. Um, there are health and safety. Uh, there are different inspections that the state can do, uh, federal or the state. You know, there's a lot of different things that the government ha sticks their nose into. But um, I think most people um, probably like having a minimum wage. You know, they don't want to wear... You want where there's more race to the top than a race to the bottom. Now, you get more kind of that whenever you have, uh, when the labor market's tight. But I always think that this cartoon is good. We affirm the right of the poor to be uh, horrifically exploited. Psst, call it freedom of contract. So here's what you have to be um, thinking about. Now, I know some people, sometimes they have their different economic theories and things, you know, you, uh, you know, whenever I, whenever you teach a class, I mean, I'm not an economics person. I mean, I, I know some stuff about economics, you know, you get, uh, you get ranges of opinions from students, uh, from social Darwinism and, uh, you know, no government interference in anything, um, uh, to people that probably want, uh, certain industries nationalized, um, democratic socialists, maybe, uh, you might call them, um, but generally what you see is, um, now we can argue about if there's maybe too much government regulation between the employer-employee relationship. Um, but when you have no regulation, 
um, which we saw at different periods of time, it was not good for employees generally. Um, so we also have to remember kind of who was backing some of these challenges. A lot of big business industry and the wealthy um, that, uh, that, you know, they had the upper hand and they had the upper hand pretty good and they didn't want to give it up. So, you know, kind of a little bit, I want to read a little bit here. So it is impossible for us to shut our eyes to the fact that many of the laws of this character, while passed under what is claimed to be the police powers for protecting public health and welfare, are in reality passed from other motives. Now, that's one question that you have to kind of think about. Should you look at the motivations of a law or just the text of the law? A textualist would say just the text behind it. So we're justified in saying, so when, from the character of the law and the subject upon it legislates, it is apparent that the public health or welfare bears but the most remote relationship to the law. The purpose of the statute must be determined from natural and legal effect of the language employed, and whether or not it is repugnant to the Constitution of the United States must be determined from the natural effect of such statutes when it was put into question, and not from their proclaimed purpose. It is manifest to us that the limitation of the hours of labor provided for in this section of the statute under which the indictment was found, and the plaintiff in error convicted, has no such direct relation and no substantial effect upon the health of the employee as to justify it in regarding this section as a health law. It seems to us the real object and purpose were simply to regulate the hours of labor between the master and his employees. Hmm. Master. Uh, I think I might want to use employees. Um, master kind of has a little bit different connotation, especially given this is 1905 and people, people literally were still alive that were slaves 50 years earlier. But there you go, Justice Peckham. Um, great, uh, great move. Um, you know, he actually was from Maine. So, um, you know, not, uh, not somebody that was, uh, um, what do you call it? Um, he was, he was pro union. Um, but, uh, but basically, uh, um, one of the things is, is that he was, even though he's from Maine, he basically was a strong critic of Lincoln and thought that the, uh, a lot of his actions were unconstitutional. Um, so um, he also uh, supported uh, uh, legislation in Maine that prohibited any people of African ancestry from ever coming to Maine. So um, under these circumstances, the freedom of the master employee to contract with each other in relation to their employment in defining the same, cannot be prohibited or interfered with without violating the federal constitution. Hmm. There you go. So that's some pretty stark language, if you just start thinking about it. So, um, you know, um, one thing, uh, it's actually just looking... So he also was not big on, um, um, he was not big on, so, you know, the thing about Justice, Chief Justice Peckham is that um, he, he really, um, I don't want to say this, um, he really was big on the 14th Amendment on this for big business and industry, but uh, um, if it was stuff to help um, African Americans, he was not that big on the 14th Amendment. Now, we have a dissent here from Justice, Holt, Justice um, Holmes, um, and there was a, uh, an additional dissent from Justice Harlan, joined by Justice White and Justice Day um, here. Um, but we, we kind of think of uh, um, the, the, the more important one, maybe, um, from Justice Holmes. Because, uh, you know, he's considered one of, I mean, just, not that Justice Harlan is not considered one of the great legal minds of the day. But his is kind of the most full-throated rejection of Lochner. So, he says, other areas have been subject to police powers in the state. He attacks the majority. He's basically saying, 
to the majority that you are taking your economic theories of laissez-faire and social Darwinism, and you are overruling elected people. So they perverted the word liberty in the 14th Amendment. A reasonable person could see that this is related to health. So, you know, if you just start thinking about this, you know, I mean, this is a, this is a really a big decision. I mean, it's a really landmark decision because what it does, uh, this and, and other things that I told you about before, like delegation of powers, um, tax and spending, tax powers, spending powers, uh, commerce clause, 10th Amendment, federalism, um, this, this was designed to take laws that particularly a lot of states were passing, but also laws at the federal level, and to basically make it where um, that stranglehold that a lot of big business and corporations and the wealthy held could not be, basically, you know, even if they, uh, even if they could not manage to um, win at the legislative level, and remember, there was a lot of government corruption back then. Um, you know, there was a lot of money changing hands. Um, but kind of what we have here is that, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, that uh, he go he says here is that. Uh, using the Fourth Amendment to enact Mr. Herbert Spencer's social statistics. So, more or less, um, Holmes saying here, and, and, a lot of, and a lot of legal scholars would say this, is that, you know, sometimes what you do is that you have sometimes a very, maybe very liberal, or sometimes a very, often much more, more conservative, um, strong majority on, a, on the court. And they hang on for a while. So, you know, remember I was mentioning the three Trump justices? You know, it always it always kind of gets me that, uh, yeah, oh, Hillary was going to be horrible, according to Jill Stein voters. Um, Hillary would not have appointed Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, or Barrett. Which is literally one of the reasons why a number of Republicans in 2016 held their nose and voted for Trump. Because they knew that he would put those people in the court. Um, they are not that old. I mean, barring some type of serious health problem or, or, or something, God forbid, that might happen to them, they're all going to be around probably, um, you know, another 20 or 30 years. So, often one of the big legacy of a president is, you know, their Supreme Court picks. So, one thing is, does this mean that all laws, that all types of laws that are involved in um, regulation of the uh, government, uh, <coughs> of government regulation of industry, are going to be overturned? Um, the answer is no. The answer actually is no. Um, and... Um, one thing is, is that, um, you know, it turned out that for a period of time, at least up until 1910, you know, between 1887 and 1910, that most cases, about five out of six cases, of 558 cases, the regulation was upheld. So, kind of the way that I want you to think about, at least in this era, up until about, up until, let's say, about um, 1910 or so, is this. Or, I mean, even, let's say, maybe 1920, when you really start to get some of those uh, 1920s appointees on the court, really, flexing their muscles. Um, which is the exception, and which one is more the rule? Mueller or Lochner? During this period of time. So remember, this is only three years after Lochner. So it seemed to threaten a lot of things. So Mueller was a German immigrant who bought a laundry business. So he was charged with violating Oregon law that had set a maximum number of hours for women in uh, factories and uh, laundries. He challenged it. 
since it did not apply to men and women. Now, um, one thing that uh, I bet you um, might uh, realize is uh, is this. There's no Equal Rights Amendment. So, um, not then, not now. So, the National Consumers League hired Louis Brandeis to represent them. Considered one of the top lawyers in the country. Now, some of this may be that uh, Brandeis just did a really good job. And uh, the so-called Brandeis brief um, to keep the law, um, you can see that it's actually uh, uh, listed here, uh, kind of uh, um, part of it, um, kind of the technique of the brief on uh, pages 598 to um, 599, um, which is kind of the technique that um, uh, most briefs follow today. So, you know, it kind of became the um, template for a legal brief. So the question is, does this uh, violate a woman's freedom of contract? So for Mueller to overturn the law, it says it discriminates against women. The law denies women employers the right to enter into contracts for the same work that men cannot. And there's no grounds for treating women differently in laundries from women who work in other occupations. So they're neither dangerous or unhealthy. So it's a law aimed at women's health, not um, it's not women's health. It's basically trying to regulate the number of hours that you can work. Um, so Oregon, of course, um, you know, you have uh, the Brandeis brief. It was an amicus brief. So it was not a brief that the state of Oregon filed. But remember, outside groups can file an amicus brief. Um, it happens much more often today than maybe it did back then. And one of the reasons of one of the reasons is, you know, bigger legal industry around things. And another is that the docket is smaller. So um, also, it's, you know, it's, it's easier to it's easier to uh, um, file things today. It's easier to print things. So the right to buy and sell labor, um, you know, it's re states are still reasonably able to uh, regulate this for health, safety, morals and the general welfare. So um, laws restricting um, liberty, um, if they have a substantial relationship to health and safety, they're OK. So there are laws in place in other countries and states. So long hours for women can negatively affect their health based on studies. So, you know, you can see here that in some of the facts that we have kind of going into the Brandeis brief, you know, reports from Massachusetts, reports from New York, reports from the um, Industrial Commission, reports from the Massachusetts um, Bureau of Labor. So it's one of those things where, you know, you, you might be able to um, you might have you might have where people are. Um, might have their own opinions on things, but, you know, it's one of those things where they did a really good job. So, now, I often say that whenever I teach this, the thing is, this case comes back a little bit later um, when we get to gender. Because um, I always say that uh, um, the case kind of comes to a good decision, but for a wrong reason. So, you know, the ability to, let's say, have some reasonable regulations here in the laundry industry, probably a good thing. But a lot of this is kind of based on the thought that basically women are dependent on men and are inferior. So you can make differences in laws based on sex. It can apply to special regulation. So they talk about um, physical structure of men and women, maternal functions. Well, you can't disagree with the maternal function part. Um, but then you got women has always been dependent on the man. Now, different people that are in a um, opposite sex relationship, you know, people are going to have different things in a marriage. But I don't think you can say that all women are dependent on the man. Even in 1908, um, you know, I'll just leave it at that. I don't, don't want to um, jump down this road too much. So it benefits women and everybody. So women need to be protected. Um, uh, of course, women do need to be protected. Um, be, be, you know, for a lot of reasons. I mean, you know, um, for instance, if you just think about it, 
who are the primary victims, uh, generally most of the victims of domestic violence, women. Um, probably something that you didn't have a whole lot of laws on back in 1908. So men and women serve different functions, according to Justice Brewer. Uh, basically saying that women were inferior to men. Now, one thing that you have to realize is that it was influenced by the Brandeis brief. But also, not, um, not trying to take the side of Justice Brewer here, this was 1908. So, um, you know, this is, uh, this is before women had the right to vote. Um, and, um, you know, the people were seeing the male-female relationship differently than probably we do today. So, guess what? Oregon extends this to everybody. Justice Brandeis recused himself because he was involved in the case before. It was a five to three decision by by the court. Five to three. That's nice. It would have been six to three had you had uh, um, Justice. Uh, what do you call him? Brandeis voting. So Justice McKenna wrote the decision. The law is neither necessary or useful for the preservation of the health of employees. No evidence was uh, um, present, present, provided to, uh, to support that contention. So, basically, uh, they're, they're not going to uh, overrule the court, or um, overrule the legislature. Um, no further discussion was necessary. So it didn't give an unfair advantage over one type of employer employee. So again, one of the things is, is that during this period, so I don't know why they picked, why did they pick 1887? Um, I think I know the answer to that. Let me just, uh, oh, that was the Muggler case. So between Muggler and 1910, I don't know why they came up with 1910 as their cutoff date. Um, maybe I should, well, I don't know. Um, maybe that's just the kind of area of the agreement. It seemed like maybe bunting was, uh, you know, was the bunting case kind of the death knell of Lochner? The answer is no. Because uh, Lochner makes a comeback. And, oh, does it make a comeback. A big one. In Adkins versus the Children's Hospital in 1923. Because this is getting to something that... Um, that um, I think that, uh, um, you know, we take we take for granted today. And that's the fact that we have minimum wages. So the Congress set a minimum wage board for the District of Columbia. So the District of Columbia today has home rule. It technically is a territory of the United States, and the territorial clause would mean that Congress has direct jurisdiction. So the board set a wage for women at 34 and a half cents an hour. So the Children's Hospital sued, claiming it violated their due process rights. They said that it... Uh, um, it, it encompasses the right to liberty with salary. So it's not only, you know, let's say hours and things, it's the government can't come in and say that there's a minimum wage. That would mean that uh, literally you couldn't have overtime laws. Huh. Because, you know, one of the, it means that you probably couldn't have unions. Because the thing is, uh, um, one of the reasons that uh, you can have unions is that the government requires that um, that employers recognize them. You don't have that. Uh, there you go. So, a laid-off employee said she lost her job because of the higher wages. Because, um, you know, does increasing the minimum wage um, sometimes lead to some decline in employment? Yes. The effect usually is not as much as uh, opponents of the minimum wage would have you believe. But it can. It can. So the question is, did this violate... So they're using the Fifth Amendment instead of the Fourteenth because of... Uh, um, it's kind of... Um, because the Fourteenth Amendment applies to states and the District of Columbia is not a state. Um, I think it should be a state. But um, didn't pass. Maybe someday it will be. 
So for Atkins to pull the law, they basically said, uh, hey, it's reasonable. You know, it's rational. Congress uh, Congress uh, relied on experience and experience of some states, uh, conducted several hearings. It's not arbitrary. It's aimed at safeguarding uh, women and children from conditions that would endanger uh, their health and morals. It's a government responsibility. It's a legitimate end. So the means are a legitimate end to this legislative exercise. So the Children's Hospital, they don't like the law. They don't like it at all. So what they said was, it's basically a wage-fixing law. Fixing prices, fixing wages, is not health or working conditions. It goes beyond the scope. So um, this violates this by restricting that woman's right to contract for her labor. So problems are not solved by excluding men either. So the law is not temporary. It's not a temporary or an emergency. So um, you have Justice, um, what do you call him? Justice Brandeis is uh, recused again. He's not participating. Um, um, so it would have been a five to four decision. But you have Justice Sutherland writes this opinion. So keep in mind the names Sutherland, Butler, McReynolds, and Van Deventer. They will represent a block of four extremely conservative Supreme Court members. And you'll see what their name is later, um, that somebody comes up with it. So, I mean, this is really seen as uh, big, really big. So basically, it's a fight, price fixing law. It, it forbids them from in, from freely negotiating for wages. Um, you notes the distinction of men and women is no longer as rigid. Um, you know, because one of the things is women do have the right to vote at a national level by this period of time. Um, and the liberty to do what wants what wants is not absolute, but it goes too far. You need exceptional circumstances. So if you could set a minimum wage law, what about a maximum wage law? For surely the good of society as a whole cannot be better served by the preservation against the arbitrary restraint of liberties to its constituent members. Uh, that's that's pretty uh, pretty big. So uh, just a little bit more quote here. It has been said that legislation of the kind now under review is required to the interests of social justice, for whose ends, um, which for whose ends freedom of contract may be um, subjected. To restraint, the liberty of the individual to do as he pleases, even if in innocent matters, is not absolute. It's not absolute, but we're not going to allow it. Chief Justice Taft, um, joined by Justice Sanford, basically thinks the court went too far. So remember I kind of mentioned a little bit about Justice um, <laughs> Taft as president. You know, a lot of people think that, he, oh, yeah, he was he was the right winger that comes after Theodore Roosevelt. Now, in some things, he was more conservative. In some things, um, he broke up more monopolies. But Taft um, was not, Taft was not one of these, um, you know, social Darwinists. Um, he was somebody that, uh, um, he hated being president. He loved being the Chief Justice. Um, in fact, um, as Chief Justice, he lost a lot of weight. Um, you know, whenever he was president, he was kind of depressed and ate a lot. He also had a thyroid um, disorder. Um, so minimum wage laws are different than maximum working laws. So be more deferential to Congress. So, but it's not for the function of this court to hold legislative acts invalid simply because they are passed to carry out economic views, which the court believes to be unwise or unsound. So he would support, you know, support these type of laws. So he thinks that, uh, he thinks basically the court should overrule Lochner. So basically he's saying, so the interesting thing, so you notice he says here, it is impossible for me to reconcile the Bunting case and the Lochner case. And I have always supposed that the Lochner case was thus overruled sub siliento. So um, that's kind of interesting that um, Chief Justice Taft, you know, is saying, you know, I want to overrule Lochner, but what he's saying is the Bunting case, he thought that it actually overruled Lochner. While what you have from Justice Sutherland, notice that, um, you know, they're basically going full on Lochner. 
you know, kind of going, Lochner, Lochner. Um, you go, uh, kind of me doing a Lochner chant. Now, Justice Holmes, um, I think you can guess that Justice Holmes was not very, um, not very um, big on this. So, also deference. Criticizing this freedom of contract, calling it dogma. Basically saying it's dogma, liberty of contract. That basically you've, take, you've taken something and made it dogma. So it's not found in the text of either the Fifth Amendment or the Fourteenth Amendment. Not good. Basically saying, you know, you, you all have invented this doctrine, basically to get what you think is your way, at the expense of democracy. So why did this case come out the way it did? So the four horsemen, Justices Butler, McReynolds, Sutherland, and Van Devanter. So another thing had happened. So, you know, you had kind of this progressive era, Theodore Roosevelt, um, Taft, Woodrow Wilson. But, you know, after, after the United States emerges from World War II, it shifts inward and it shifts more conservative. Um, basically thinking, you know, maybe the governments did a little bit too much. You know, were they more reflecting the national mood? Now, I think that um, trying to say that, I think kind of um, maybe goes, I, I, I'm not sure. Because, you know, you have Warren Harding, Calvin Coolidge, and Herbert Hoover as the three presidents during this 12-year period. So they basically were kind of all uh, all in for laissez-faire stuff. Basically, you know, um, the government that uh, governs best is the government that basically doesn't do anything. That, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to take our hands off of, uh, of corporations. We're going to take our hands off of industry. And what's going to happen is... And what's going to happen is this. Things are going to get good. There you go. But one of the things that you have here, bunting, the bunting decision versus the Atkins decision. It happened six years later. You had four changes of the court. Now, you already had Justices Van Devanter and McReynolds on the court. But what you did have is uh, Justice Clark and Day were replaced by Justice Sutherland and Butler. So you kind of further cement this um, pretty conservative majority. Now, I don't want to say. Uh, sorry. Um, so there are nine members of the court. So remember that clip that we saw um, near the beginning of this, the session or semester or whatever you want to call this thing, um, where the person said of William Bre or uh, Bill Brennan said Bill Brennan would tell all of his clerks the most important word is five. You need five. So the question is, can they get a fifth? There you go. Um, we're going to find that if they were going to get a fifth, it pretty much had to be Justice Roberts. No relation to John Roberts, by the way. But here what we have is kind of an interesting case. Um, one thing that... Uh, I think that likely a lot of folks that uh, are not that that don't know much about upstate New York might not know is how big our dairy industry is. So I think some people just are kind of like, well, New York produces a lot of milk. I think some people probably, um, you know, I think y'all probably know I'm not from this area. I'm from southern Indiana, basically from Kentucky. Um, I got this question. I got this question. When I lived in Binghamton. And I got the question when I, since I lived in Buffalo. I often have people, oh, you must be close to New York City. I'm kind of like, no, I'm not. I actually live closer to Detroit than I live to New York City. Um, I think some people forget that, uh, you know, while the population of New York is downstate, um, there's a lot of land upstate. 
We have a lot of agriculture. We have a lot of cows. We produce a lot of milk. New York produces some of the best cheese in the country. New York sharp cheddar. So one thing is, is that um, if you're a farmer, if you aren't, um, if you aren't making money, if you aren't making a profit, um, you know, you probably aren't going to do it much longer. So there's a whole set of things with the milk industry today, but um, but the New York creates the milk control board. It set prices. So they set the price at nine cents a quart. So Nebbia sells two quarts of milk and a five cent loaf of bread for 18 cents. So you can kind of see what he did. He sold it for six and a half cents a piece. He was convicted, um, fined five dollars, paid a fine under protest. So he said it interfered with his ability to do business. So New York justified it by saying that the farmers needed to get a good return on their product if the country wants to have a good supply of milk. Dairy industry very important to New York. So did it violate the 14th Amendment? So Mr. Nebbia says it did. Uh -huh. It did. So Leo Nebbia. So they're basically saying it's a price-fixing law. Um, others have been struck down. So it discriminates against him because um, the provisions are more restrictive on stop keepers that sell milk in different ways, such as home delivery. And also, you know, a national the fact you have a national emergency doesn't suspend the Constitution. And we're kind of hearing that argument. So, you know, they're going, going out, not, not just saying that this, um, this right to contract is not just between employer and employee. It's between a, a, a shopkeeper and a um, customer. So um, that is a picture of some cows in upstate New York. Uh, I did not take it myself. I found it on uh, Google. New York wants to pull the law. They said here that um, this is the state's police power. The New York legislature found that this was needed um, to try to do something about the price of milk. So because of the importance of milk, they said that milk could be regulated as a public utility. Um, hmm, it's kind of interesting. So fixing prices is a form of utility regulation, and there's a clear public interest. The law should be upheld. What you have here is that... Um, the swing vote on the person known as the swing vote on the court back then was Justice Owen Roberts. Now, um, we'll see a little bit. I'll talk a little bit about FDR in the next lecture. And just to let you know, if you're kind of interested in more of some of the stuff about the Stitch in Time that Saves Nine and uh, some of the things that the New Deal Court does, uh, I would encourage you, if you haven't taken it before, to take Political Science 303 Constitutional Law. If, uh, if this stuff is really kind of. Uh, um, getting your interest up. Um, I sometimes, uh, you know, I sometimes teach it during the summer session and I usually teach it one of the semesters. You just have to, just have to look at the schedule. Um, so the liberals came out ahead. They got, uh, they got Justice Roberts. Again, no relation to, um, what do you call it? John Roberts. It's actually a fairly common name, I think, Roberts. A general rule, the use of uh, property and contracts is not a public concern, but it's not absolute. You can have some reasonable regulation when it's in the common interest. So one of the things that I think it's important that uh, Justice Roberts says, and this kind of ties back a little bit to the Mueller case, and that is that New York built a substantial record as to the need for this. So New York was kind of, um, it's, it's not that they uh, had the uh, Brandeis brief, but they had a lot of um, documentation as to the reason that, uh, you know, maybe this would not necessarily work in a lot of other cases, but you've shown why it is necessary. So the problem with surplus milk and price cutting in stores were that farmers were making less than the cost of production. Now, he rejects the thing about, about milk being a public utility. Now, remember, the reason that the reason that we allow such regulation of public utility, public utilities, I think I mentioned this, I don't know when I mentioned it, um, is that, you know, like I had said, you know, 
if I want to have, if I want to have um, electricity, you know, um, I kind of have to go through uh, National Grid. I mean, it's not like I have a list of uh, um, places that I can get electricity from. Um, so, no reason that you would do so. But uh, he says that the case that this is a little bit more analogous to is uh, Munn versus Illinois. So, kind of what we have is a big nod to judicial deference in that if the laws have a regional relationship to a proper legislative purpose and is not arbitrary and discriminatory, the requirements of due process are satisfied and the court will not disturb those laws. That's kind of big. Because, um, you know, it kind of, uh, you know, does it kind of neuter um, Lochner a little bit? Maybe. But... Uh, how much? We're going to see that, uh, and remember, that the Four Horsemen, plus Roberts, and sometimes actually more than Roberts, some, not all these decisions were five to four um, during this kind of New Deal era. Um, so there were some that were eight to one and nine to zero. But, there were a lot of tools in the toolbox of these conservatives. So Justice McReynolds, um, he said this is a regulation. This is not regulation, but management control and dictation. It deprives him of the fundamental right to control his decisions, Mr. Nebbia. So it allowed the government to convert nearly every sector into public utility. So making a slippery slope argument. This would, all, this would basically put an end to liberty under the United States Constitution. So, you know, he's kind of seeing it almost in apocalyptic terms here, if you will. So it take away the ability of New Yorkers to buy milk on the open market. Now, you know, we're, we're talking about six and a half cents versus nine cents. Remember, this is in the Great Depression, and people didn't make as much money. And people, I think, drank more milk. Um, so he says some people might be able to get the milk cheaper, and the grocery would oblige. There you go. Well, hmm. Another case from New York came to the court a few years later. And that was when New York tried to pass a minimum wage law. It said that you couldn't have a wage that prevented women from being paid an unreasonable and oppressive wage. Less than their reasonable value of services and below the minimum cost of living needed to sustain health. Now that's kind of a one thing is, it's, it's a, little, a little bit vague, a little bit vague. Um, I think that, you know, one thing is, that I think probably people would like the way that's written. Um, you know, the minimum wage should be kind of the minimum standard of living. So, um, kind of an interesting set of events here. So, um, uh, you know, women worked at a laundry, um, you know, invoked this against uh, Joseph Topaldo, the manager. So... He pays employees about seven to ten dollars a week, and the board here said that twelve forty was reasonable wage. So you know, you just think about that. Uh, seven versus twelve fifty. You know, seven dollars versus twelve fifty. You know, probably doesn't sound like a lot these days, especially since uh, um, we've been gripped by uh, inflation. Um, you know, if you've been to Europe, uh, uh, they're having inflation worse than us. So I mean, it's not. Uh, it's not something that makes us particularly uh, unique right now. But, you know, there you go. Um, I just thought, thought I'd mention that too for folks. So he's found not, he was found guilty of not paying them. So um, he actually, interestingly, received some support from the National Women's Party that uh, opposed the law for some different reasons. Um, um, Basically saying that, uh, you know, the law, the law should have made men and women equal, that uh, it was giving, you know, it was biased. So, one thing is, women, women were kind of here, were divided, and they were the beneficiary. But, you know, I think it was some people were like, uh, you know, we're the beneficiary, but I don't, we, we why, why shouldn't it apply to everybody? You know, we aren't needed to, we, we don't need all this. So, one of the things that happens in this case, it was decided closer to Atkins than Nebbia. 
And Justice Ro Owen Roberts goes over to the Four Horsemen. Huh? He goes over to the Four Horsemen. It's a five to four decision to strike down this law. Some people said that FDR, with this decision and some others, basically just kind of had it. Next time, what we'll do, the death of the Lochner Doctrine. So we'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, because I, I know some of you probably will never take Political Science 303. Um, kind of this um, watershed time in our nation's history where... FDR wins this giant landslide in 1936 and tries to fundamentally shape, reshape the Supreme Court. And then the thing that I want you to kind of think about is this. Um, when you're when you're doing your read, it, it, you know, if you all want to do your readings before or after the lectures, that's up to you. I, I find some people it's more helpful after, some people it's more helpful before. Um, you know, but think about this. If not for West Coast Hotel versus Parish, if the court would have kept doing what they were doing, would FDR have been successful in the so-called court packing plan? Did the fact that the court basically was like, eh, we'll let your New Deal stuff go through. And then you had several retirements which was which. So that's what we will do next time. We'll also see, um, we'll see with Williamson versus Lee Optical, where it's kind of like, go ahead and do whatever the hell you want to. Um, and then we'll see uh, a couple of interesting cases where substantive due process kind of comes up a little bit in some other areas, kind of creeps its head up a little bit, but not, but not in the Lochner era. So we'll see that the Lochner era dies. You know, ding dong, Lochner is dead. But next time. See y'all later.